Feels like we're in game week right here. Hi, Ryan. Um, I know Kirk Herbstreit threw it out there that you might be considering giving up play calling duties. Can you get into that? Are, are you considering that? Um, how would that work if you do that? Um, I know a lot to unpack there. Yeah, yeah. Um, what we're going to do is go through the spring, um, talk to Brian about that, and create some environments where we can call it, you know, have Jim call it, uh, have an opportunity for Brian to call it. And then we'll we'll come up for air at the end of the spring and kind of figure out what that dynamic looks like uh, going into the preseason and then to, the, then to obviously the season. So we won't decide on any of that now, but certainly give him an opportunity to kind of call it the spring and, and see how that goes. Jerry, so there's one guy in the portal that you um, probably will land that you can't talk about. But can you talk about the other guys that yeah. you have that you can talk about? And do you feel like you're done adding from the portal or could you add maybe – Another player. Or two. Yeah, I think there's there's two different windows. You you know the first window there, and so I guess we added um, you know five guys there um, in different areas, and um, I think you know it's been pretty clear that when we bring guys in, and you know from the transfer portal, um, it's to fill needs. You know we're not just bringing guys in to bring guys in. So uh, all of these guys fill a need for us. First off, uh, Jihad Carter comes in um, at safety. You know we're now in that three safety system. We wanted to make sure that we had the right numbers there. Jihad has stepped right in uh, right off the bat and done a nice job. And so we're looking forward to seeing him on the field this spring. Um, Victor Cutler, um, you know, having Luke Whipler um, declare uh, we needed another guy, especially inside. So, um, you know, looking looking forward to see what he can do this spring. Uh, John Furlman comes in as a long snapper since, um, you know, Brad um, graduated after a nice long career and a very productive career here. Um, you know, so he again fills a need, and then Tristan Gibia comes in uh, in a unique situation where, um, you know, we always want to have four quarterbacks on 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 the roster here. That's not easy to do in today's day and age. Tristan has played in a rivalry game out there, Oregon versus Oregon State. Did a nice job there. He has shared with us that he wants to be a, uh, a GA and a coach, and felt like coming here was an opportunity to build his um, network, but also provide some depth and, and be able to uh, possibly you know help in that room. Um, now he's coming in. With the mindset that you know if he gets on the field he's ready to go, but um, thought he was really uh, a great addition to the room and can help mentor some of those young guys in there. Frank, can you, just to go back to you know, maybe the offensive play calling, even if you don't have a plan right now, can you? Why is it that you're more open to it right now? I think you've alluded to in the past all the demands on your time that aren't related to coaching. Uh, is that part of your thinking here? Why you're more open to it now than maybe you have been in the past? Yeah, I, I think when you year after year you 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 sit down and you evaluate um, you know everything in the program and certainly evaluate where college football is and demands of the job the way it is now as opposed to two years ago, four years ago, and, and then uh, as we started. But um, you know, and have to look at uh, time management. I think that during the season uh, or during the off season, no, no problem at all. Beginning of the season, you know, pretty good. As I, as we get to the middle of the season, end of the season, you know, I, I feel like there's times where I have to, you know, manage my time a little bit better and make sure that, um, you know, as a head coach, is enough presence going around the building late in the season. And so, trying to figure out how to best remedy that, um, you know, just making sure that I'm, I'm I'm evaluating myself as the head coach the right way. And there's a lot of different things that are changing on a daily basis. And so, um, you know, whether that's giving up the play calling and letting Brian do it or not. Um, you know, we'll decide that here um, in the next few months, probably. Um, but but just trying to figure out how to do a better job of that. You could have done anything with that position. What made Brian the, the pick for you? Yeah, well, first off, uh, I think Brian has done a great job in his football career of, you know, you follow all the way through in high school. Then he comes to Ohio State, uh, plays at a high level, then goes on to the NFL, and not only has an NFL career, but a sustained NFL career. And um, you know, maximized himself. Uh, then he comes comes in, steps into a situation here where he gets thrust into the wide receiver role. It does an excellent job. Has now really, in my opinion, done a job of solidifying himself as the best wide receiver, the, wide receiver coach in the country. And I think that's important as a coach is to get really good at something, be an expert at something. And because of that, um, in his recruiting and his development of that wide receiver room, um, you've seen his development. Now this year, he, he took on the role as a pass game coordinator and challenged them about protections, challenged them about even learning about the run game. And I thought he did a great job of that as well. So um, his recruiting is certainly important, understanding Ohio State. He loves Ohio State. Uh, he's going to you know, be able to now recruit the whole entire offensive um, you know, room and, and um, you know, recruiting class, uh, but also just 
you know, he's his knowledge of offensive football is is excellent. And now he's got an opportunity to take that next step in his progression. I think that's that's natural for him. But I also feel comfortable because I think we have a good staff in there. I think Justin Fry as the run game coordinator will do an excellent job in there. And and that's a very important job to be able to put together the run game, put together the protections and tie those two things together. So I know what the two of those guys and I'm also still going to be very much involved with it. You know, I'm going to be in there every day and and we'll figure out how that shakes out. But um, we're going to have to replace Kevin. And Kevin was very strong in that area. But um, you know, I think Justin Justin Fry's got an opportunity to be the best old line coach in America. Uh, you can see what he did this year in his development. So um, and then the rest of that room is, is really strong. So I think that's where you know I felt comfortable and I felt like it was the right progression for Brian. Ryan, the, the quarterback competition this year, what makes uh, Devin difficult competition for Kyle? What makes Kyle difficult competition for Devin? Um, I'm excited to see these two guys compete. What an unbelievable opportunity for both of them. Um, when you look at the guys that are surrounding and the, and the cast that's surrounding them, um, I mean, you couldn't be more excited to be quarterback right now, I would think, in college football. So... Uh, Kyle's now going into year three. Devin's going into year two. So I'd say, you know, Kyle has one more year of experience. Um, and and I started one game. You know, he's played in games more than Devin. Um, but it's going to be a heck of a competition. You know, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. They both have a little bit of a different skill set. Um, and, you know, it's going to be fun to watch them compete this, this spring. Is there a danger in not having a starter after spring? Um... You know, I don't know. I don't know where we'll be. You know, I, I hope that one of them emerges and, and we can we can name them a starter. I really do, um, because I think um, the way that our dynamic is, I think, you know, it would be great for our program to be able to do that. There was times in the past where, you know, I just didn't see that happening. Um, I'm hoping that can happen. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But, um, you know, some 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 vision on who the starter is coming out of the spring would be nice. So, Hoping that one of them emerges here in these 15 practices. Fourth row right, Cameron T. Robinson, the athletic. Ryan, you mentioned their different skill sets. When you've seen them in practice, what have you seen from them, and how much have you seen Devin grow since he he first got here? Yeah, no, he's he's grown. He's um, he's done a good job. You know, it's hard when you're um, the backup, as you know, especially you know it, you know for Devin being the third, you're splitting sometimes the backup reps when you're trying to get CJ ready to go. Um, the good news for both of them was in the bowl practice. There was a few days. I think CJ was down for a day. Then he went to the Heisman for a couple of days. So those guys were able to step up, and, and we had some really competitive practices in there. We were actually able to see those guys compete, and it, it was good to see. Um, and, and I think at the end of the day, you know, both of them do, you know, things a little bit different, you know, in their skill sets. But uh, the, the guy who's the leader, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and is competitively tough, is going to ultimately win the job. Going into his third year, how do you how have you seen him handle that back of role now going in for his first year? He's grown, he's grown, um, and I, I think he's done a good job of it. His attitude's been excellent. Um, you know, he's very hardworking. So um, now it's time to go put it on the field and compete. Third row right, Rob Allen, Columbus Dispatch. Ryan, there's this narrative out there uh, that, that Ohio State's falling behind in NIL. Um, do you agree with that? You, you still have a top five class. Um, what more can be done? Does more need to happen? And how are you adjusting to this Wild West? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think the first thing is, you know, we're we're really situated in a great situation for NIL. Um, you know, what I've been told is that, you know, in, in terms of legislative things coming down, we don't foresee a lot of change here in the near future. So um, I think when it first happened, nobody was too sure of how this was going to shake out. And, you know, in short order, people have handled it in different ways. I think our guys have done very, very well, um, but a little bit different in the recruiting area because there's different parts of NIL. There's your current team, there's the portal, and then there's the recruiting area. I, I think because it's going to be here for a while and it's not going anywhere, uh, this, is, this is something that really has to be done well. It has to be built the right way. It's, 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 it's going to be a big business. And so um, – you know, in order to do something like that, it has to be done the right way. And certainly, you know, at Ohio State, you know, we're held to a very high standard. So um, there's a lot of people working hard towards that. Uh, I'm excited because I think that ultimately we're going to be in a really good place. Um, but sometimes in order to do something, it takes a little bit longer. We're all urgent to get it done. 
Um, but I am confident here, you know, um, over the next couple of months, we're going to have a really good plan together in place um, and have an opportunity to be one of the, uh, the best in the country. Because when you combine everything that we have here, certainly we have an opportunity to be the best in the country. Frustrating is it when you hear these other stories? Maybe you hear them, maybe you don't. Yeah. And what's going on? And just like we can't, do, we can't do that, or should we be doing that? Yeah. How, I mean, what are those discussions like? Gene, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, trust me. Yeah, there's a lot of conversation about it, um, and there's um, yeah, there, there's frustration. There is. Um, anytime you're in a situation where you know things can get gray and and you know there's uncertainty, um, it, it creates a lot of hard feelings, but. Uh, I think where we sit right now, we have a vision of where we want to be. And I think what the po most important thing is that we go and do it now and put this plan together and then move forward. But, yeah, to say over the last year there hasn't been that type of, you know, angst, yeah, I, I'd be lying. I mean, that there is um, that feeling. And, um, and, and the biggest thing I think we've done, though, is we've advocated for our guys. I think the guys that have come in in this class um, love the product that Ohio State has to offer. And... Certainly NIL is a big part of it, and some of our guys are doing really good. The majority of our guys are doing very, very good. Um, but it's also the product of Ohio State and what Ohio State has to offer in the city of Columbus and our program and our development and, you know, playing in the shoe. And just there's so many things that come with being an Ohio State Buckeye, too, that so many of these guys understand. Um, and I think when you look at our class, that's going to show in the end that these guys really understand what that means. That being said, you know, we're going to advocate like crazy and put this together so that, you know, we're able to take care of our guys the way that they deserve to be. Front row right, Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch. Ryan, to follow up on some of the, the play calling stuff and, and Brian calling plays in the spring, what do you look for in a play caller? Um, and what will you look for in those situations from him? What kind of feel can you get from, from spring and him going against Jim? Yeah, I think it's just it, a lot of his experience. Um, just you know, getting a feel for those situations and getting your mind wrapped around situations and being prepared. And um, it's really just the experience of it. Um, you know, uh, once you, you know, you, you start to you know do what you learn and you make mistakes and you learn and just like anything else. I mean, there's a time where, you know, I had to call it for the first time and, um, you know, and then you make mistakes and you learn. I think that's one of the things that Brian has done an unbelievable job of, um, you know, in his career. You know, when are you really ready to call plays? I, you know, I don't know. I guess you're ever, when are you ready to be a parent? When are you ready to buy your first house? You don't know, right? But you figure it out. You learn. You make mistakes and you learn. I, th you know, now it's time to really, you know, have an opportunity here this spring and then hopefully in the preseason to do those types of things and, and try to create game environments, which I think is also important for the quarterbacks. As you look into the spring, I think uh, our team, the more game-like situations we can create is going to be uh, important. You know, usually in the spring, it's so heavy on fundamentals and segmented drills. We're going to do that. But I also think we need to put some game situations in there, let the quarterbacks play, let the coordinators call it. Are you giving any thought as well to how, how you'll do reps with the quarterbacks as well? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't got that far yet, no. Yeah. Right next door, Tim May on three, Letterman Road. With that in mind, do you, do you – you intend to make this a fair fight at quarterback, right? I oh, mean, yeah. Are, are they starting from ground zero? I mean, uh, obviously, Kyle was the backup last year when, when was the first guy to go in. I, how do you in your mentally, you mentally, because I would think that the head coach makes the call finally. <laughs> how do you go back to ground zero with guys when you already know something about them? What's the trick to that? Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I, I mean, they're both going to get a ton of reps, you know, and, and, and Tristan's going to get some and – um, and then when Lincoln gets in in the summer, he'll get some as well. But, um, no, I mean, they're, they're going to get a bunch of reps and compete, and you try to do the best you can to look at you know, their statistics, like their completion percentage, and there's a lot that goes with that, you know, drops and, and things like that. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's got to be the guy that our team believes in and the coaching staff believes in that can lead our team to a championship. That's, you know, not always clear. You know, it it's sometimes can be a little gray, but you do the best you can. Just a, an adjunct question to that. Uh, can you be a true leader as a quarterback until you're named number one? Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, uh, uh, until the head coach or somebody says, this is our guy, how can you exude yourself as a leader? Yeah, I, I absolutely think you can. Yeah. Um, you know, I was told the story that, um, you know, I, I don't know the exact truth, whether it's become more of a an urban legend or not, but when, when Tom Brady first went to the, the Patriots, you know, he, he bought this funky looking car. And the reason he did it was because when everybody showed up, his car was there. And when he went home, everybody saw the car was there. And he set a standard 
and then you have to set a standard and a work ethic. And then once you create that standard, you have to help others live up to that standard, whether it's inspiring them, encouraging them, challenging them. And that's what being a leader is. And usually, you know, when, when you have a leader like that, someone says he was a leader when he walked in the building. Sometimes it takes a little time. Now, uh, being named the starter sometimes can give them more confidence to help them give a voice and put them into situations where they have to lead. Um, but uh, I think, you know, some it's a skill that you can learn. And you don't necessarily need to be the starting quarterback to be a leader. And one of the, my number two question was, running back wise, at the end of the year last year, it's like y'all were robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yeah. Is there? I mean, you can visualize right now y'all having four or five guys in that room. It, it could be as stout a room as you've had. Yep. Uh, uh, is it crazy how that goes? And number two, is Travion, for example, will he be available during the spring? I mean, just what, what's sort of the approach there? Well, it's funny. I was, I was thinking about that. Um, Going into the preseason, we talked about how we had Mayan and Trey, and how was that going to work, and who was going to get all the reps. And you look at the way the season shook out. You know, we were we were relying on Down and Chip and X to to carry the ball for us. Uh, we even had Mitch Rossi at the end of the game playing for us in the final drive at, at tailback. So uh, I think I mentioned it last year. You're going to need everybody. I think the room has a chance to be very strong, which is great. But when you when you're talking about that many number of games, you're going to need them all. And we did last year, and we're going to need them again this year. So. Um, yeah, there are a couple guys here that will be out for the spring. This is not everybody, but I do have a quick list of guys who won't be available this spring. Uh, Julian, Emeka, Tommy, uh, Trey, uh, Mitchell Melton, uh, Court, and um, I can't read your writing here. Is that Pryor? Uh, Evan Pryor won't, won't be available. I, I think there'll be a couple more, and we'll give you an update as we get closer to spring, but these guys have had um, you know, some long-term just surgeries here. Um, we'll have them ready after the spring, but we're just going to be careful with them throughout the spring. So, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, uh, second row left, Stephen Means, Cleveland.com. Just given the level of this program, there's just typically some work that has to be done to get here even as an assistant coach. Yep. Um, you have three guys in your staff who didn't necessarily take that route. They come up with GA to assistant coach level with Brian, Corey, and Parker. With those guys, uh, Oh, is there a trait you see with guys like that who yeah. can make that jump immediately, whether it's as a recruiter, developer, all of the above? No, I think it's a great question. I, I think it's important to have guys. You know, there's a lot of really successful organizations that, you know, uh, promote from within, when appropriate. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we've we've gone outside the program, but uh, for guys who are really intelligent, work hard, understand the culture, and can bring value to our program, um, there's um, there's a lot of value in that. And I think you've seen Brian do it at a high level. Um, I, I'm pleased with some things that we saw with Parker this year, and, and now I'm excited with Keenan. You know, I think uh, he's brought unbelievable value here in, in the, over his years. I think you'll you'll hear from the guys on the team and just people who have been around him. Um, you know how how talented he is, and so I don't necessarily think you have to go outside and then come back. So, you know, I felt like that a little bit when I was younger. Like I I have to leave to now get hired to come back. Well, what, what's the difference? Well. If, if those guys are uh, qualified, then you know they understand our culture. Then there's a seamless transition. Then, then I think it's important to do that. Now, there's times where that doesn't fit, but I felt like it was the right thing to do with all three of those guys. You said for Tristan, part of the reason he's here is because he wants to be coach. And yes. As a fourth guy, it's probably easier to learn that from a place that's developing quarterbacks like right. that. In those conversations with him, did maybe that change your philosophy of how you go about looking for a fourth quarterback at times, given the different ways you've had it since you've been here? Yeah, I mean, when you look at when we had Chugs and we look at, you know, Gunnar Hoke, you know, those were the same type of conversations, a little bit different than, than than with Tristan. Tristan was really made it clear that, you know, he wants to be a coach and, and this is an opportunity to, you know, almost be like a graduate assistant this year and, and help mentor that room. But that being said, he's at, he's played football and he's been in rivalry games. He's played more football than anybody in that room. So, um, so I thought it was a unique situation. Um, you know, I, I thought you know Corey did a good job of identifying him, and um, and I think that's that's important when you look at some of those NFL teams and you know those those guys are in the backup roles. You know, those guys who are supporting the starter. Um, you know, that really helps with the culture, and I'm hoping he can provide that for us. And and who knows? You know, you just never know how things shake out. I mean, look what happened to the 49ers in that game. You know, they're down. Uh, you know, they didn't really have much of a quarterback to play with at the end of that season. You know, you never know what's going to happen. So we want to make sure we have four guys. We haven't always had that because it's hard to find people in this role. And I think it's a unique role that uh, Tristan's willing to take on. And so we're very grateful and uh, certainly have embraced them. Uh, Coach Jacob, Jason. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, third row left, Dan Hope, Lemon Warriors. 
Ryan, as you mentioned, you guys have already added five transfers. That's more than you've ever added before in one year. Do you attribute that more to just having more needs this year or to you guys adapting to the portal becoming a bigger thing? Uh, probably, yeah, probably both. Um, we haven't had a lot of, um, you know, folks transfer out here. You know, I think we're probably below the, the average. You know, we'll see what happens after after spring practice. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm – you know, when you look at after all said and done with this class, and you look at guy, I think we had we had twenty guys, right, uh, Jerry, yep. with twenty guys, and when you look at the average, the quality of the guy was really really well done. So um, I'm I'm really pleased with that part of it. You know, I'm, I know there was some guys down the stretch that you know we we didn't quite get, but um, again, when the dust settled, it's it's a very strong class. It wasn't a big class because we didn't have as many needs, and we did well. We didn't have. Uh, the, when you look at the numbers, we wanted to fill some holes with some more experienced guys. And I think that's where I guess we ended up with 25 guys in terms of an addition, which is typically what a, a normal class would be at 25 guys. Um, when you have a need, uh, like for instance, at safety, you know, where, where, you, where you need to have some guys step in the offensive line because you lose a guy because he leaves early, you, know, you want to maybe fill that in with a more experienced guy. When, when that fits, you, you do it. And, and that's what we've done. We'll see how it shakes out this spring, but. You know, that 25 number is typically what we've done in terms of guys leaving and then guys guys coming in. How do you feel about the situation at offensive tackle right now? Well, you know, okay. It's going to be uh, – I won't get into kind of what we're thinking and where we're projecting it. You know, we're going to, you know, move a couple guys around and take a look at some different things and see how that goes this spring. We'll uh, make some hard decisions as we get closer to spring, and we'll talk about that. You know, we'll share that with you guys. But, um, you know, hoping that some of these guys really step up. Certainly Josh Fryer has got a big challenge ahead of him. Um, I'll get into kind of some of the other movement, but um, I think we have a chance to have a good offensive line, you know, and, and certainly we've added Vic. And, um, you know, if we feel like we have to add somebody else, I guess we will. Right now, we're going to go into the spring with the guys we have, see how we go, see how things go, evaluate it, and then come up for air at the end of the spring. One more from me. Uh, Tyler Friday, Pauli, and Ateote, neither of them have announced what they're doing. Are you expecting either of them back, or are they both moving Who on? Who was the first one? Tyler Friday, Pauli, and Ateote. Yeah, no. They're both moving on. Was there any chance that C.J. Stroud was going to stay? No, I, I won't speak for, for C.J., but, you know, I know that there was a lot of, um, you know, back and forth for him, and I know that there was a, um, you know, he, he, he loves his teammates, and he loves Ohio State, and, um, you know, he took a long time to try to balance it out to figure out the positives and the negatives and, and all those types of things, and, um you know, I'm, I'm excited for his future. I'm excited to see how this thing shakes out the next couple of months and what's the next step for him. But, um, you know, I, again, I don't, again, you'll have to ask him, but I'm sure making that decision wasn't easy. You know, he took about as much time as he could and, and was really thoughtful in the process. And I thought it was very thorough. Was there ever a chance, did you think he might stay? Was there a time when you thought, oh my gosh? I mean, I was hoping, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was hoping. We've talked about the turf and the field here at times during the year. I, I think the Tennessee Titans have a similar turf to what you guys have, and they are changing their turf for next year. Uh, are there any ongoing discussions? Do you have a view on the turf that you play and practice on right now at Ohio State? No. I know that there was a point where there was some questions, uh, but um, after that, uh, I, don't, I don't recognize any issues that we've had with it. Um, it seems to be good. It seems like the guys like it, but um, I guess now's a good time to look into that, and I'll look into that, and if I have more information, I'll let you know. But Jackson Smith and Jigba, maybe Jordan Hancock, maybe a few others. It felt like you maybe had some guys who had some lingering soft tissue stuff this yeah. year. Is there anything that you guys are double-checking, evaluating with your how your training, your, you know, your medical staff, anything? Do you have any things you want to check into with that no no I, I feel very strong about our, our, our doctors and sports medicine and um, I, I think th those were two um, similar situations but but also unique to themselves um, again without getting too many details of, of how that all went with Jackson in that game you can see how awkward that was and um, that was um, again I'm, I'm not a doctor but it, it had to do with the, the hit itself as opposed to running and that had created its own set of issues and um, I know he tried several times to come, and then they said, you know, at this point, the best thing to do is just shut it down. And that was hard for him to do. You know, I know that there's been a lot of speculation about, 
you know, him being able to play towards the end, but he was, he was told to shut it down. And, and so that was hard for him and got a lot of respect for Jackson. Um, you know, Jordan fought to come back and, and now he's got to get really strong in the off season and, and really go. But, uh, but no, I mean, I think our guys have handled it really well. I think we have some of the best in the country. There's just some things like this that happen along the way. And, um, you try to do the best you can, but, but overall, I think we've done as good as anybody over the past few years. And I just want to clarify something you said about the play calling discussion. We know there's like the NIL stuff and all these outside things that take time from coaches, but you're talking about middle end of the year. Is a lot of your consideration sort of like making sure you're the culture coach, you're meeting with guys, you're spreading that message. Is that as much your consideration as anything that you want time for that? Yes. Yeah, I think that's it. I'm when, and you, you just have to, every year you take a look at it and you figure out how can I get better. And I think that that's something that I'd like to be able to do more and be stronger at the end of the season. Um, you know, when you're so caught up with the weeds of what's third and four and fourth and two and in the red zone and those type of things, it can pull you away from that a little bit. And so um, not saying that it won't happen that way, but just want to make sure that I'm thoughtful of that and make sure that I'm strong in that area and, and doing my part. No, this is my ninth question, but I have to ask about this. Because you mentioned Tom Brady. Yeah. He retired again today. Right. It. Was his first year as a starter your last year as the starter at New Hampshire? Yeah, so uh, his, yes. Yep. So um, when I got done with my senior year, um, that was the first uh, year he was a rookie. And uh, me and a couple of my roommates decided the day before, I think it was like on a Thursday, we were going to get in the car up in New Hampshire and drive down to New Orleans. Well, yeah, we took we got a rental car and drove down to New Orleans to see them play the Rams, and uh, with no ticket, uh, we slept on the floor of a buddy's room, and um, and a buddy or, or a friend of ours bought us a flight back after the game, but that was his rookie year, and then the rest was was history when Venetieri kicked the field goal because you know I grew up a Patriots fan, so that was that was really the the first big Super Bowl, and um, I remember in '85 when they played the Bears, that was big. They played New Orleans. But when they beat the Rams, that was the start of, of that whole dynasty up there. And um, what an unbelievable career um, that he's had. Um, somebody that I've looked up to, you know, as, um, you know, when I played, watching him. And then as, as I've kind of gone on with my career, I, I, I tell my, my, uh, my family he's older than me, you know. So, like, just amazing that he's just um, taking care of his body. He's the pillar of unbelievable discipline. And... Um, you know, what an unbelievable career. Um, in my opinion, the best quarterback to ever play the game. Uh, Trevor Middle, Bill Rubilis, Columbus Dispatch. Yeah, I, I also wanted to ask about the offensive line. I mean, you look at every other position group and you, you probably feel pretty good about it. Um, you know, that is, that's the major questions at almost every position there. How concerned are you about that? And, and specifically, is Matt Jones going to slide to center? Is that the idea right now? Right now, the idea is to keep Matt and Donovan at, at guards, um, find a center. Um, you know, I think Carson Hinsman has had a really good bowl practice, and, and Jacob won't be here this spring, but, um, you know, he'll be in the battle. Uh, Vic has also played some center. So we'll try to figure out, you know, out of those three, if we can we can find a starting center there. Uh, Josh, um, you know, will be important for him to, to step in. He did play some for us last year. He started in Michigan State game uh, and uh, two years ago, and then this year he had a start as well. Uh, was it the Indiana game? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and played well, but now it's a different different when you're a starter. But so it's an important off season for him. Um, and then we have a few other you know younger guys that are going to have to step up. You know, I think we're going to move Tegra to tackle. Um, you know, you have Zen at tackle. Um, you know, George is is got to have a great off season. And then you know we're excited about some of those younger guys being able to step into those roles and and see if they can give us give us something there. But um, we have to find two new starting tackles. Josh at left tackle probably. Is it That's we're we're working through that now. Yeah. Um, also, James Laurinaitis obviously was hired. Um, do you envision him kind of going maybe the, the Brian Hartline route where, okay, first year you're, you're kind of mentoring the linebackers, you're coaching them, but not officially, and then next year or whenever, you know, he steps into that kind of role. And, and what do you think he brings? He brings uh, great experience. He brings somebody who's a, another former player on staff here, which is exciting to me. You know, when, when you have guys who uh, played here, played the NFL, uh, but now we're back part of the program. It just means a little something more, and I, I totally recognize that. Um, he understands what it means to be a Buckeye and, and um, certainly was excited to get back to Columbus. Um, so uh, I think that's the first thing. The second thing is experience. You know, in his role, he's accountable coach, which is great. 
and um, you know, excited for him to get here and jump in with two feet, learn Jim's system. I know he's excited to learn from Jim about how, how we do things, and I know the, the linebacker room is excited to have him. Um, and one last thing. Have you gotten over you know, how close you guys came? Is that something that's going to stay with you for forever? Yeah, of course. I mean, every year you look back on situations and, you know, a play here, a play there, and, you know, you could be national champs. You know, certainly that, that does, um, you know, it's not going to go away. But at the same time, you can't let it, you know, dominate your mind. Yeah, you, know, you got to move forward. Life's going on. But, um, but yeah, I mean, when, when you get that close like that, it hurts. It stings. And, um, you know, time does heal all wounds, but it's, it's going to take a while. How much did Luke declaring for the NFL catch you guys off guard and drastically alter what you thought your plans were going to be for this year? Yeah, um, we 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 were hoping that Luke would would not declare, but um, he did, and wish him nothing but the best of luck. And and uh, he'll be a very good pro. He, he did play a lot of football here, but you know it's not normal to lose two guys um, after three years. But both of them are very talented, and you know certainly Paris should be a top ten pick and. And hopefully Luke can get drafted, um, you know, early on. But uh, yeah, that that one we didn't really, um, you know, certainly expect. So, you know, we have to be able to adapt, and that that was part of, you know, bringing in Vic and, you know, figuring out what that's going to look like. Just thinking about some of those guys, like, you know, potentially Donovan, Vic, Tegra played guard last year. He says he's going to tackle. You yeah. seem to give a lot of guys who could conceivably kind of play anywhere along the offensive line. How much? Mixing and matching, do you think you might do throughout the spring to try to find that right five? It even means like playing a guy, I don't know, three different positions in one practice or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. We 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 want to make sure that we get somebody good at playing one position, and then and then go from there. But that being said, sometimes you don't know what you have until you move guys around, and um, you have these these three freshmen in here as well that uh, that came at mid year for a reason. So it'll be fun to watch them compete for the first time, and and that's. You know, Justin will be kind of trying to figure that part of it out. What is the right combination and the right mix of guys? Because each position requires a certain amount of skill set, you know, with the center, the guards, the tackles. There's a little bit different there. But, um, you know, sometimes you don't know what you have until you move somebody there. Uh, uh, deep uh, center, Justin Holbrock, WCMH. What do you need to see from Kyle or Devin to help the offensive line along, gain confidence and gain experience without having that experience from all of them? Uh, I mean, there's a lot there. I think the first thing is the leadership and the confidence. Um, I think when you identify the most successful quarterbacks in, in NFL right now and then in college football, I think all of them can can extend and, and, and help the offensive line by um, creating plays. I mean, you just watch these games on, on Sunday here as, as we head into the playoffs and into the Super Bowl. You know, these guys can all move. They, they can create. And I think when you have a young offensive line, that's a great way to be able to help them. What do you try to do for both of those quarterbacks to allow them that freedom to create when they're trying to, you know, fight for this spot and show you what they've got? Well, I think you have to put them in game situations, you know, to be in a seven on seven, three and a hitch and throw it. Now, that's good. You know, you have to learn how to do that. But we also have to let them compete and go play in the game. Um, because, again, the more you watch, the high level, like I think when you watch CJ play in that Georgia game, man, he made some plays with his feet, he extended, he competed his tail off, and, and that's winning football. And so um, we have to create those environments for them this spring and then into the preseason. Right next door, Spencer Holbrook, Letterman Row. Right. I have been asked a lot about the offensive line so far, but what do you need to see from those guys that you listed, whether it's Carson, whether it's Josh, in the spring and during the winter that makes you think that we won't have to go into the floor one day and yeah. try to find that body? I think the first thing when you're talking about offensive line is you got to be tough. I think about you know, the guys that we've had here in the past. They, the, the, the best ones have been tough physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, because you think about the offensive line, I mean, that's, that's a thankless job. And, you know, there's no ball over there. They just sit over there in a the corner and just bang against each other all day. You know, that's, that's what it is. You have to be tough. Um, you have to be smart. You have to know what you're doing. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, then how the heck can you do your job? So you have to be tough. You have to be smart and know what you're doing. And then you also have to have the skill set to be able to do it and, and, and you know, fail and learn and grow. Um, you know, sometimes, again, when you look at the guys who end up making it in the NFL or guys who make it uh, at the highest level of college football, it isn't just because they're super talented. It's because they've, they've failed, they've learned, they've found different tricks of the trade, 
but ultimately they're tough and, and they're smart. So, you know, all those things tie in to the consistency that we're looking for. In the past, if you guys weren't very aggressive in the transfer portal, you just added, you got two guys from the secondary coming in. It seems like you're willing to be a little more aggressive. Do you guys feel yourselves doing that a little bit? And that, is that a gradual ramp up to maybe trying to be more aggressive as time goes on and, and learning how to navigate the portal more each year? I think there's been times where there's been, um, you know, prospects available in the portal that, you know, we didn't feel it was appropriate just to bring in another guy. Um, what we've done is we filled holes. When you look at Justin and Trey and Jonah and, you know, Noah Ruggles, I mean, th these have been situations where we've had a hole and we've addressed that issue. Um, you know, my concern is that when you start bringing in too many guys just to bring new guys in from different programs, the culture in that locker room can can start to get affected. And I just, I'm very sensitive to that. I'm sensitive to the guys that we have that have put a lot of work into the program. Our off-season program is the backbone of our program. And so just to start throwing guys in like that, I, I think that's, um, that's a little risky for us. Everybody does their business differently, but I want to make sure that we keep that solid. CJ and James, both on staff now, four players who have been here and done everything that, that you know, Ohio State is supposed to do. Do you think that that kind of helps with the culture when you're in the world of transfer portal and all those things? And how important is it to have guys who have been here and, and been in those wars that can kind of relay that culture uh, when you're trying to keep it amid all the things that are going on? Yeah, I, I think it's um, it's exciting. You know, when, when James was added, um, you know, Jerry reminded me that I think we have six former players now part of the program. And, um, you know, Tim Walton, who played here, and, and Hart, and James, uh, Owen Fankheiser, um, and Devin Jordan, you know, so like you said, C.J. Barnett, you know, these are guys who understand what it means to be a player here. And to your point, I think that absolutely matters. Yeah, I just think, you know, whether it's a recruit in their family or um, whether it's a player, you know, they, they've been there before and they understand what that means. And um, and what it means to be a Buckeye. And I know for me to have those guys part of this thing is, is really important. So uh, I think it does make a difference. Jerry, we're, we're not going to be able to get through everyone. We've got just time for a couple more. Jeremy Birmingham, uh, Rivals. Um, despite having three teams that finish in the top 10 in the final polls this year, the Big Ten, depending on who you look at, will have two five star signees in the class of 2023. Both of them are wide receivers here. A lot of people, I think, assume a lot of that's NIL related around the country. Could you have that sort of on-field success you expect recruiting success? Is there any conversation league-wide around how to fix what's going on, or are you guys just dialed in exclusively on we need to fix this year first? Well, I think um, we, we, we had a, um, a meeting yesterday. Um, what We're going to have some meetings in Chicago um, in a couple weeks. Um, I think it's – maybe President's Day, and then that next Tuesday, uh, we'll all be flying to Chicago to talk about all of these type of, of um, the subjects. Um, and so, yeah, it's every it's kind of unique to everybody. Um, I, I think sometimes when you can sit in a room with a bunch of you know guys from the conference and start to talk about what we're seeing, then certainly in shared practices, that can, that can help. Um, but I also think NIL is a little bit unique to each institution um, in coming up with their plan. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to figuring out what that looks like and having those conversations, everybody in the conference. But um, but I do think it's a little bit more unique to each, each university. How much does that conversation shape the way you guys are viewing 24 or 25 classes? Ohio is always obviously important, but it seems like there's been a, an added uh, emphasis on it in the last couple of weeks. Is yeah. That, is that relative? Is, is that related to, to NIL? Or is it just Ohio has better players than they've had in the last five years? A little bit of both. I think we have really good prospects in the state. Um, and I also think that, um, you know, it matters to have guys from the state of Ohio now more than ever. But uh, but I'm excited about this next class. I think that we have an opportunity to sign a, a really good class. So we just have to make sure everything's in place to make sure that we can go do that. Um, that's the bottom line. So uh, there are some really good players in the state of Ohio this year, though, which is really exciting. And, um, you know, that certainly makes a big difference for us. You've had 11 new guys come into the program three weeks ago. How have Luke and Austin, very mature kids, yeah. how have they handled their transition? I think it's been excellent. Um, when we went through everybody yesterday in a staff meeting, and um, the, the, the feedback was very, very good. Um, I, I, like you said, I like their maturity. 
um, you know, physically they have to continue to get stronger. And we had a team run earlier this morning at 6.30. And, um, you know, they look good. They look good moving around out there. Uh, I'm excited to see them compete. Um, I tell them all the time, you know, and I'm going to bring them in and tell them again. You know, there's going to be some point in the spring where you say to yourself, man, I hate this. I don't even know if I want to play football anymore. That's part of the process being a freshman. But um, I think that's become easier and easier. I think about, again, when I, when I – you know, checked in my first year. It was in August, and we were checking into a dorm, and you were meeting everybody for the first time. You know, in terms of your your teammates, these guys have known each other for for a long time. They know what this is. They've seen workouts. They've gone to spring practice. They've been around. Some of these guys were actually, you know, at at the bowl practices. Um, they weren't actually really allowed to compete. You know, to be a part of it. We didn't do that, but they saw it. They know what it looks like. So I think that's been um, a little bit easier for them to assimilate into the program even early on in our workouts. I think. I'm hoping that this group can be a little bit further along there. And when you can do that in the spring, that usually leads to playing in the fall. Um, and so, uh, yeah, good group so far. Uh, Pat Murphy, 24-7 Sports. Ryan, in 2019, you guys lose a close semifinal to Clemson. And that offseason, you were pretty public about that being a motivating factor to get back. Obviously, 2020 was a strange season, but you do make it to the national championship game. Does this feel similar this offseason, or is it a different approach when in talking about the Georgia game and, and kind of a motivating factor? Um, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, there's a lot of guys who are highly motivated. You know, when you get that close, um, you're talking about one or two plays and one or two calls, and just, you know, that, that, that hurts. It does. And so um, I, I know it's motivating to our guys. But when you think about that year, you know, there was COVID, right? And it was all that. So it was, that, was a, that was a strange year. Guys fighting for a season. And there was just so many more things on our plate. And um, I guess it was probably about a month from right now when everything got shut down. So that whole off season was, was unique. But I think that they were individually motivated during that time when we weren't together, where they were working at home. And I just think about Josh Myers and Justin and some of those guys just being able to work. Um, we'll, f we'll see how this, this team comes together. You know, we're still in the early stages of it. Um, you know, we've got Matt drills coming up here in the next couple of weeks, so excited about that. But, but yeah, when you get that close and, and um, you, know, you know, when you don't win the rivalry game, those things, yeah, I mean, they, 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 they sting, and, and certainly they, they wake you up in the morning. James was here. James Lordias was here doing radio, Big Ten. Why was this offseason when you decided to bring him in? Was it just the experience at Notre Dame, or was there more to it than – than that. Uh, James and I had spoken a couple of times, and um, I think one of the things when you have a, a former player, uh, it's like, do you really want to get into coaching? <laughs> Are you really that crazy? You know, and um, you know he shared that he was, and then had an opportunity to go uh, to Notre Dame, and and um, and you know shared with me that you know he still this is what he wants to do, and and so felt like the timing was right here. Uh, we've got time for just a couple more. Nathan Baird, uh, Cleveland.com, far left. Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify something. When you were talking about the NIL and you said that there's a difference between, I guess, the overall picture and then specifically the recruiting picture, the letter of the law, it's not supposed to be involved in the, the recruiting side of things. Um, so I guess your, your frustration right now, is it that that is happening and isn't being interfered with or enforced or whatever, or that um, it's, it is that, that is a reality now and Ohio State isn't well enough poised to compete there? I think there's two things. I think one, um, there's there's just the the, the different, um, you know, you, you have the team, your current players, and then you have talent acquisition, which is the portal and, and recruiting. So I think those are just different, just in general, when you're trying to identify and have conversations about NIL. You know, I, I think that the, the frustration is just that, um, and I think it's for everybody across the board, no matter where you are. I think at all coaches would share the same thing. It's just that, you know, when this get passed. You know, there was uh, very little guidelines. There's just a lot of, um, you know, you know, unknowns of, you know, what can and can't be done and, and what, you know, certain people are, are, are offering to players and, and just things like that. Now, again, whether it's, um, you know, collectives or businesses or things like that, you know, you just it, – it's hard to tell. It's hard to figure out where everything's at. And so anytime things like that happen, there's hard feelings and frustration. That being said, we can start to see the dust settling here. We're starting to figure out, you know, what what's going on out there, uh, what the market is, what what it all looks like, and so 
um, again, I, I feel confident that we're going to have a good plan here in the next couple months. Um, and excited about that because it's going to be important, especially for our current team, but also for you know the class of 24. There's been you know, a lot of rumors out there in, in recent weeks, months about players uh, or programs trying to poach other players. And as you're saying, sometimes that's maybe entities tangential to the programs, not the programs themselves. Um, there's Ohio State players said that that was going on. Is it? Do you feel like that is happening more now? And is that also sort of one of the gray areas that you now have to kind of wade into because of the new reality? Yeah, I, I mean, there, it's it's illegal to do, and so if people are doing it and it's not being enforced, yeah, that creates hard feelings for sure. Um, whether it's being done now more than than in the past, I'm not sure, but um, but yeah, anytime anytime you're going down the road of things that are uh, illegal that aren't being enforced, yeah, that that can create frustration. Steve Hellwagen, Brian Bush on the Sports. Yeah, Coach, I want to ask about conversations with Jim Knowles. At, uh, there were a lot of great advances made, it seemed, on defense, but then in your biggest games, there were a lot of breakdowns. And um, you had leads against Michigan and Georgia, and, and John Cooper, who was a coach here, he had a comment, you, you want to gamble, but you want to gamble with my chips. I mean, were there some unnecessary gambles taken in those games that he talks about giving up two or three big hits a game? Is that, is that sustainable to, to win at the highest level? No, no. I mean, we can't, we can't give up big plays like that. Yeah, I mean, it's... That, that hurt us in the last two games. I mean, there's no secret there. Uh, too many big plays. And, and you know, if we're going to win those games, we can't give up big plays like that. Now, was that the only problem? No. But 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 I think, you know, Jim knows that, and um, and that's something we got to get fixed in the offseason. And just one other thing. Uh, did you guys, after the game, pursue anything with anybody in terms of officiating regarding the Marvin Harrison play? What elements of targeting were not present? And... I know you were concerned about his health in the moment and didn't press it with the on-field officials, but what? any explanation from anybody about what happened with that? Can I say something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't get yes. in trouble. Yeah. But yes. <laughs> I've tried to pursue it. You can't get a straight answer from anybody about No one will even talk about it. So yeah, I, this I, is the championship of your sport, and there's no transparency. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I made a lot of calls after the game. Um, I felt like it was targeting. Um, in the moment, and when things are moving fast and you can't see the replay, it's very hard to see. Um, the hard thing for me is to see and understand that and tell, you know, have our, um, our medical staff let us know that he was knocked unconscious, and that's why we're not going to put him back in the game. Um, yet the, the flag gets picked up for targeting. Uh, I, I spoke with... Um, the officials in the Big Ten and, um, you know, had a great conversation um, with Bill. Uh, I then called at the Pac-12 to find out an explanation there. Um, the explanation that was told to me was that it wasn't forcible enough. I then asked um, to speak with uh, the head of the officials, Steve Shaw. Uh, he explained to me that um, the hit um, didn't go right to Marvin's head, that it was not a force or it wasn't um, a shot right on his head. It was to the shoulder. Um, I completely disagree with that, but but that was the decision that was made, and those are the two explanations I was given. Coach, thank you. Okay, you. thanks. <laughs> hey, folks, you we got a personal foul without targeting. Yes, sir. Folks, we have assistant coaches out there. I